Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here with another China History Podcast episode, number 112 this time, handcrafted for your pure sinophilistic enjoyment. Today's story concerns the rise and fall of the Jewish community in China centered in the city of Kaifeng. The Jews in China went way back. No one knows for sure just how far back, although there's plenty of speculation. To quote a certain former U.S. cabinet official, quote, There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. Unquote. I couldn't have said it any better myself. As I dug deeper into their history, I concluded you could say the same thing about the Kaifeng Jews. But it's a great story, so let's look at uh, what was up with that. I guess it's part of urban legend and part common knowledge that there was this uh, lost colony of Chinese Jews or that there was this thriving native Jewish community there. Those more schooled in Chinese history might know this Jewish center in China was in Kaifeng, but not necessarily knowing where Kaifeng was and certainly not knowing why Kaifeng of all places and not someplace more obvious. So the purpose of today's episode is simply, as we did last time with the Wu State, and as we often do, just sort everything out and give you the main idea. A lot of people have heard of the Kaifeng Jews, but other than that, they can't say much about the subject at a cocktail party or even a Seder. This is a story that goes back as far as the origins of the Silk Roads. The Jews, of course, came from Israel, some left this land voluntarily, or as was most often the case, involuntarily, and sought out greener pastures elsewhere. Jewish merchants were among the earliest people to traverse the Silk Road when it started ramping up during the Han Dynasty. Remember Zhang Qian? He made his first journey to the West between 138 and 126 BC, the time of uh, Han Emperor Wu, Han Wu Di. This is where the whole Silk Road history takes off. So Jews had been coming to China since at least then. They didn't stay long or build a community, but they, you know, had made their way to Xi'an and all the other great Central Asian trading centers that had, you know, already sprung up along the pathways of the Silk Roads. Trading luxuries along the Silk Road was something that Jewish people, small though their numbers were, played an unusually large role. There evolved a group of Jewish merchants called Rodinites. Their origin is unclear, but for centuries, they managed a big-time trading operation that sold goods throughout all the major markets of the known world between the Frankish Empire and China. They went as far back as the Merovingian dynasty and covered all the overland and sea routes between the west and the east. They were in the middle of everything. We know of these Jewish traders from the Persian geographer and writer Ibn Khordadbe, who lived from 820 to 912. This was the time of Islam's third caliphate, the Abbasid. He wrote a book of the times that managed to you know, make it to this day without getting burned or lost to eternity. This book mentions the Radhanites as being Jewish traders. He said they were particularly gifted in all the languages of the Silk Road, and they carried out trade by land and by sea. In the Persian language, or at least back then, Ra uh, means path or way, and Dan means one who knows. So they were the ones who knew the path or knew the way, to China and back, presumably. The Radhanites, however, were all gone by the 11th century. Once the Crusades kicked in, it really threw all the trading operations into disarray, and it was right around then or shortly thereafter that there is no further mention of these Radhanite traders. What an amazing life these guys must have led. From Han to Song, when hostilities between Christians and Muslims got in the middle of market supply and demand, the Radhanites were often the go-to merchants of choice because at that time, Jews and Muslims got along famously, or at least better than the Christians and Muslims. So they played a unique role in the linking of the markets of the East and West during unstable times in that part of the world. The earliest evidence of a Jewish presence in China was pegged at the 8th century AD, Tang Dynasty. Also from that period, there's the cornucopia of artifacts discovered 
by Sir Oral Stein at Dunhuang. These Persian and Hebrew writings found in the caves of Dunhuang dated back to the Tang period and mention the Jews. Again, the Rodinites were by now a major force at that time. If anyone chanced upon someone of the Jewish faith in China, for sure they wouldn't be in the entertainment business or a doctor. It's almost for sure this Jewish person walking around Tang Dynasty China was doing the same exact thing any Sogdian, Persian, Arab, or Central Asian was doing. They were all plying their wares along the Silk Roads connecting east and west. These traders from all points between China and Rome were the worker bees of the whole system. Despite the regular visits from Jewish travelers and traders, there was still no known Jewish settlement or central place in China where you were always guaranteed to find a minion or a hot kosher meal. The popular consensus regarding how long the Jews have been coming to China says it's at least since the Han, with no settlements until the Song. There's no proof of life in the Zhou dynasty, although Jews are mentioned in one of the uh, stone steles we'll get to uh, in a moment. There's also this far-out theory that claims in 721 BC, when the Assyrians invaded the northern kingdom of Israel and exiled the ten tribes, one of them escaped to Asia and came to China, or, or at least to India. It's just a theory, the lost tribe of Israel. The Han, incidentally, coincided with the Roman persecution of Jews in Judea. 70 AD, this was a bad year for the Jewish race. August 70 AD, Titus destroys the temple in Jerusalem, and the Jews scatter. But not before a million of their people fall to the Roman armies, and 100,000 are sold into slavery. The first Jewish-Roman war, not ending well for the Jews, and when they rise up uh, against Hadrian in 132 AD, once again it won't end well for them. The Han Emperor uh, Guangwu was uh, reigning at the time. Now, whether these wars with the Romans provided any extra impetus for Jews from conquered Judea to escape the heat and flee to Han China, that's purely speculative. It's certainly a possibility. The Silk Road did exist. The Jews were heavily involved in the east-west trade along all these routes. There were these Romans, Babylonian, Assyrian persecutions. These are all facts that we know, although the detail is severely lacking. But there's plenty to hang your hat on later on when the Southern Song kicks in. So despite the dearth of evidence to the contrary, it's uh, safe to say Jews were visiting China during the Han Dynasty. But being... Almost 2,000 years ago, this uh, Xi Fan is about as thin as you can get, and we're only left to speculate about their life in China. The Tang was a golden time, at least for a while. There was a tremendous amount of tolerance for all the religions and races. Followers of Islam, Judaism, Manichaeism, Zoroastrianism, Nestorianism could all be found in the capital, Chang'an. It was the most amazing and cosmopolitan city in the whole world. Because the Jews were so dominant in the trade of silks, spices, and other luxuries, they came to Tang China quite often. In 781, this was during the time of the uh, Tang Emperor De Zong, the city of Bien was founded. It will go by several names. Bianliang is another. Bianliang was the name of the city during the Song Dynasty. It's best known to us today as the city of Kaifeng. It was located right on the south bank of the Yellow River, just west of the Grand Canal. The Grand Canal we discussed in the last episode. It was the Wu King Fu Chai who built the Hanko that served as the beginning of the Grand Canal. And the canal, the greatest engineering marvel of its day, would be built and completed in 609 AD under the uh, Sui Emperor Yang Di. I think digging a man-made canal the distance from L.A. to Dallas is right up there with constructing the Great Pyramid. 1,400 miles. Digging this canal changed China. That's all I can say. Well, eastern China anyway. Let me quote the Song Dynasty poet, Qin Guan, who said of this ancient city, quote, Kaifeng, surrounded by level land in all directions, is a convergence of roads which connect it with the Chu River to the south, the Han River to the west, the Zhao River to the north, and the Qi River to the east. Neither great mountain ranges nor big rivers isolate Kaifeng from the surrounding regions. 
In fact, its communication with them is aided by the Bien and Tsai and other rivers. The waterways teem with boats, the bow of one touching the stern of another, while men, carts, and animals jam the roads in an endless flow from every corner of the country. Kaifeng was, in its day, not just the capital, but the commercial and political center of Song China as well, when China was the richest, most vibrant economy on the planet, and had been for centuries. The Silk Road didn't just end in Xi'an, in Chang'an. It also led further up the road to Kaifeng as well. Kaifeng, like Xi'an, attracted merchants from all over the world. Over a million people lived there during the Song. Today, there's four to five times that number. Back in the Tang, it was only about a 10-day, two-week trek for a caravan between the two cities. This area of ancient China is as ancient as China could be. Running east to west, one after the other, was Kaifeng, Zhengzhou, Luoyang, Sanmenxia, Weinan, and Xi'an. Weinan, of course, the birthplace of Sima Qian, who we quote often in these podcasts. This slice of Shanxi and Henan has served as the epicenter of ancient Chinese history from mythical times all the way up to the Song. So the moral to the story is, this was in its day perhaps the largest commercial center in the world. So it was only natural that these Jews from all over the Middle East and Central Asia would find their way to Kaifeng. They didn't just choose Kaifeng just for its proximity to the Yellow River. In the Song Dynasty, this was the place to be. On the opposite end of these roads that all led to Kaifeng were the markets of Europe, Asia, and Africa. So why did the Jews end up congregating in Kaifeng and ending up staying for a few centuries? I mean, this was the New York City of its day. The sea routes were a different matter. And by the time of the Tang and Song, the seas were dominated by Persian and Arab fleets. These traders left behind plenty of writings and evidence attesting to the role of these uh, Jewish merchants. There were Jewish merchants all over China, and they could be found wherever major markets could be found. Guangzhou, Quanzhou, Ningbo, Yangzhou, and Hangzhou. There could have been settlements at these places, and there could have been synagogues built too. But it was only in one place where historical records survive that shows unimpeachable evidence of a Jewish settlement and native people following Jewish laws and traditions just as their fellow Jews in Europe. And that's really the main part of our story. In 1163, the Jewish residents of Kaifeng received the okay to build their synagogue, along with all the necessary extras required of a Jewish community, a mikvah, a sukkah, a place to butcher meat according to the laws. This temple was flanked on two sides by teaching Torah Lane North and teaching Torah Lane South. The southern Song Emperor Xiao Zong himself had given the approval and even gave an imperial order that they should follow the customs of their forefathers and settle in Bianliang, which, as I said, was uh, what Kaifeng was called back then. The original Jewish settlers in Kaifeng were 70 Jewish clans who left en masse with their families and everything they owned. They brought everything from their previous synagogue, including the Torah scrolls, of course. This was a caravan that had a destination in mind. You know, later on, the locals would sort of group them in with the Muslims, you know, because on the surface, anyone not familiar with the religions, like in China, you know, they appeared similar. So the Jews uh, were differentiated by uh, being called the blue-headed Muslims. Anyway, there were 500 people in this one congregation. They came to Kaifeng and settled there. These people from far away with their strange rituals and traditions became very active in the local community. Before long, their numbers and influence began to grow. They served in the civil service. They served in the military. These original Jewish settlers from unknown origins, as I said, took their whole families with them when they came to Kaifeng because they knew they weren't going back to where they came from. It's no secret that Jews throughout history often had to cut and run when they ended up being singled out for persecution. Now, when I say they came from some unknown place, that's not entirely true. There is evidence that might trace this group from the Mediterranean coast of Turkey, from the town of Bodrum. Bodrum today is about a three-hour car ride south of Izmir. These Jews had come to this idyllic spot from the city of Samoa in Babylonia. 
This is you know, present-day Iraq, of course. They left Babylonia in times of persecution and settled in Turkey. Although the proximity of Bodrum to the Holy Land wasn't that close, it was close enough. And the blowback from the Crusades that you know, kicked off in 1090 made things too hot for the Jews of Bodrum. So they just picked up and left. And this congregation marched through Turkey to Persia, through Turkmenistan, Xinjiang, and finally to China proper, first arriving in Xi'an and then further on up the road to Kaifeng. As I said, during this time in the Song, the population of Kaifeng is already over a million souls. And it was to Kaifeng, in this most ancient part of one of the most ancient provinces of China, that they came, probably sometime in the 10th or 11th centuries. And the story of this Jewish community is mainly told in three stone steles. I've heard that pronounced without the E on the end, but I'm just going with what Merriam-Webster is telling me. These carved stone steles are mostly what we have to go on as far as a timeline and a history and a point of reference as to the prayers they offered and their, you know, adherence to tradition. There were four steles, but one was lost. They were always placed in the courtyard of the synagogue. For centuries they stood, telling the stories of their history and showing the prayers so that all future generations might, you know, keep the faith alive. The three steles that made it down to the present day were dated 1485, 1512, and 1663. So this is the period in the West, roughly from the time Columbus discovered America to Charles II and the restoration uh, of the monarchy in England. The Ottomans and Europeans at that time are slugging it out on the continent. During this time, the Jews of Kaifeng were having their heyday. The community peaked during the time of the Ming, uh, which was 1380 to 1644, and then after that, late 17th century into the 18th. From that point on, it was a slow, steady decline. Let's talk about those three steles and a little about what they've told us. Trust me, there is a whole body of scholarship about these surviving limestone slabs. Countless man hours of study have gone into them. So I am not going to bog you down in the content. Go on Google Books or just use your favorite search engine to get everything you wanted to know about these Kaifeng steles, but we're afraid to ask. The oldest... The 1489 stele is divided up into three parts. It tells the biblical stories of Abraham, Moses, you know, all the way up to Ezra, who returned the Torah to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity in the 5th century BC. It mentions the prayers and principles of fasting and repentance. Now, the second part of this oldest stele tells the story of the founding of the Kaifeng Synagogue in 1163. This is right about the time the compass gets discovered. Henry II is on the throne in England. And one year before the founding of this Kaifeng synagogue, somewhere on the steppes of Mongolia, Genghis Khan was born. Except he wasn't Genghis Khan yet. The third part of this 1489 stele is very interesting and gives a whole comparative analysis of Judaism to the three great religions of China at the time, Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism. It explained the basic principles of Judaism within the context of Chinese understanding at the time in Ming China. The monument dated 1512 suggests that the Jews first came to China during the Zhou dynasty. It mentions that Judaism came to China during this time via India, but again, there's no evidence to confirm this, and there were no silk roads during those Bronze Age Zhou dynasty days. This 1512 Steely, the experts are still trying to figure out. It says a lot, but they're not entirely sure what it says. It did mention that there were other Jewish communities in China besides this one in Kaifeng and that they had established contact with each other. The 1512 Steely also stresses the loyalty of the Jews to the Chinese state, even quoting the immortal words forever associated with Yuefei, tattooed on his back by his mother, Jing Zhong Bao Guo. It explains how the Jews of Kaifeng were throughout the fabric of Kaifeng society. They were officials with degrees, members of the literati, soldiers and merchants, and they loyally served the state. And this stele has carved in it all 19 blessings from the Amida, the Shmona Esra, including the Sim Shalom. 
a traveling Jews from the Middle Ages. If one of them came to this shoal in Kaifeng, he knew these guys were legit. The 1663 stele was similar to the one carved in 1489. It went to great lengths to compare, once again, all the similarities between Judaism and Chinese religious practices, particularly Confucianism. It mentions family, traditions, a moral basis for life, and charity to all. 1663 was quite a historic time in China. The Ming Dynasty had fallen with a whimper in 1644, and this stele tells the story of the fall of the dynasty as well as the antics of Li Zicheng and the ultimate founding of the Qing dynasty. Li Zicheng we discussed in the CHP 34 Ming Dynasty Part 4. This steely lets it be known with all this chaos going on in China, the community was still trying to keep the religion going. As Ming transitioned to Qing, it was a rough time. The synagogue was destroyed by rebels and anything of value that had been passed down from the time they started keeping records was just burned, looted, or stolen. This was a hard thing to bounce back from. The Jews of Kaifeng had gone to the brink a few times, but this one was looking like it was going to be a hard ditch to crawl out of. You see, Kaifeng also, being so close to the Yellow River, China's sorrow, and close to all these other rivers, fell victim over the centuries to a number of natural catastrophes. Most damaging were these floods that would immerse the whole synagogue, destroying everything that couldn't be moved to higher ground. In fact, these steles were always built whenever they would rebuild these synagogues. And this Kaifeng synagogue was not a marble palace like Temple Shalom on Lakeshore Drive in Chicago. These were totally Chinese structures. Carved wood, bilateral symmetry, courtyards, sky wells, and all the decorative details that Chinese architecture is famous for. So these structures, made mostly with organic materials, didn't have a chance whenever there was a major inundation. It had to be rebuilt many times. After things began to settle down, in the Qing Dynasty, the synagogue was rebuilt again in 1653. The 1489 and 1512 steles are today locked in a room at the Kaifeng Municipal Museum. These are, of course, a must-see stop on the Jewish history tours that have passed through Kaifeng. Anything you want to know and more can be learned from visiting this museum and meeting with a few of these descendants of the Kaifeng Jews, many of whom are actually uh, going back to Judaism. You can fly to Zhengzhou, then take a 90-minute shuttle, and you're in downtown Kaifeng. Jumping backwards, uh, sorry about that, Marco Polo, during his 13th century travels in China, mentions running into these Jews in China in 1286. Marco Polo also, by the way, had mentioned that uh, Kublai Khan was familiar with and celebrated the holidays of these uh, monotheists. During the Ming Dynasty, one of the emperors had conferred upon the Chinese Jews seven surnames. I, Shi. Gao, Jin, Li, Zhang, and Zhao. If you meet any descendants of Kaifeng Jews on the streets today, you have a one in seven chance of guessing their surname correctly. I guess in this story, the marquee year has to be 1605. This is the year that a fateful meeting took place. It happened between a local Kaifeng Jew named Ai Tian and the subject of our CHP 98 episode, Matteo Ricci. This is where he meets Matteo Ricci, known around town by his Chinese name, Li Ma Do. Ricci and the Jesuits were living in Beijing at the time. Remember, they tried and failed to get into Beijing in 1598, but the Wanli Emperor later gives Ricci the thumbs up in May of 1600. So, 1605, the Western religions are enjoying a period of great tolerance, and this tolerance, of course, we all know, won't last forever. But in Beijing, 1605, it was a good time, and now this meeting is going to take place. Ai Tian, by the way, was a scholar who had passed the civil service exams and happened to be in Beijing in 1605 looking for some appointment to the government civil service. That's where you had to go back then if you had a degree and wanted to, you know, work the system. So, Ai Tian had left Kaifeng and was up in Beijing when he heard it through the grapevine about these potential Jews there who were of this, you know, monotheistic faith and seemed to practice similar rituals. 
So Aitian seeks out these Jesuits and has this encounter with Matteo Ricci at their Jesuit mission house in Beijing. When Ricci first meets Aitian, he thought he was a Chinese Christian. And of course, Aitian believed Ricci at first was a Jew. There's an old story that says when Aitian first saw the painting in the mission house of the Virgin and Child, he believed this was Rebecca with either Jacob or Esau. The Jews in Kaifeng back in 1605 had never heard of Christianity. So isolated were they in so many centuries had it been since the 11th when they first settled there. Ricci figured out after a while, remember he spoke fluent Mandarin, you know, which is what they spoke in Kaifeng too, that this Aitian was in fact a Jew and not a Christian. So when Aitian later returns to Kaifeng, Ricci sends along a couple of his gang, a couple of Jesuits, and they accompany Aitian back to Kaifeng, and sure enough, they see there's this whole thriving community with a synagogue and a mikvah, the whole works. These Jesuits checked them all out thoroughly and reported back to Ricci, who, of course, you know, sent the report to the head office in Rome, and all these letters from Ricci and those who came after him survive in various collections. They verified that these Chinese Jews in Kaifeng were observant of the Sabbath from you know Friday sundown to Saturday sundown and were observant of all the Jewish festivals, very much the same as the Ashkenazi or Sephardic Jew you might encounter anywhere in Europe or the Middle East. They circumcised their sons. They didn't eat pork. They had all the important Hebrew manuscripts, said the same prayers, seemed to have the same Torah, but they would check that out in detail later. From what they could see, these Kaifeng Jews were very much the same as you might find in the West. But these Jews were in Kaifeng, in Henan province, right in the middle of the center of the cradle of Chinese civilization. Once they learned all this, the Jesuit order sent plenty of specialists to Kaifeng to learn and study these Kaifeng Jews, or Tiao Jin Jiao, as they were called, those who picked out the tendons, you know, referring to one of the uh, dietary laws that the Chinese must have considered particularly foolish and wasteful, you know, being one of the best parts and all. So there's plenty in the Vatican archives regarding the Kaifeng Jews, and they took a lot of notes over the next decade or so. You see, the thinking was, these Jews, so isolated, who had built their first synagogue during the time of the Song Dynasty five and a half centuries before, there was this belief that they might have copies of the Torah that had, by chance, remained uncorrupted and uncensored by the Jewish rabbis from days gone by. The Jesuits didn't learn anything, and none of these Torah they examined in Kaifeng said anything about Jesus uh, being the Messiah. You see, that was the deal breaker. The aged chief rabbi in Kaifeng, he just couldn't get past the point that the Messiah wasn't due for another 10,000 years. So how could this Jesus Christ be who these visiting Jesuits claimed he was? But to show the rabbi was a good sport, as he was getting up in years, he invited these emissaries of Ricci to go back and tell Li Ma Do that he was welcome to replace him as chief rabbi of the Kaifeng Synagogue, you know, assuming he would accept these Jewish beliefs. So after this amazing encounter 408 years ago, there were perhaps seven or eight more generations of Jews in Kaifeng before the steady decline reached a low point that the community never bounced back from. The synagogue was destroyed by natural disasters and rebuilt again in 1653, but sadly, by the late 1700s, hardly anyone could read Hebrew anymore. The last Chinese rabbi passed away in 1810 with no one waiting in the wings, trained or qualified to fill his shoes. Countless centuries of intermarriage, assimilation, and complete isolation from the rest of world Jewry sort of doomed the Kaifeng Jews. By 1854, the synagogue had fallen to ruin. The Qing dynasty by now was going downhill with a stiff wind at its back. There was enough chaos and despair in China to keep people's minds occupied during this time. The Taiping Rebellion isn't going to help as far as providing an environment for the Kaifeng Jewish community to make a comeback. Truly a lack of rabbis, if nothing else, will put a major damper on any Jewish community. If there's no rabbi, then there's no one to congregate around. So without this essential leadership to serve the spiritual needs of the Kaifeng Jews, 
their slide into assimilation and the abandonment of their faith and traditions happened that much faster. The ability to read and speak the Hebrew language was, you know, one of the first things to go. It was said that by the mid-1800s, so far had the Kaifeng Jewish community slid that they used to display the Torah scrolls in the central marketplace with a sign beseeching anyone who knew how to read Hebrew to, you know, come seek them out. By the late 1800s and into the 1900s, the Jews of Kaifeng were rediscovered by Protestant missionaries and other Western travelers in China. Attempts had been made to revive the community. The Canadian uh, Anglican Bishop uh, William Charles White of Toronto tried, but his attempts were not successful. He helped establish the Catholic Diocese in Hunan Province. This mission was to last for 25 years. He purchased the land where the synagogue had stood for all those centuries. He also acquired many of the surviving garment and ritual pieces, and Torah scrolls, as well as the remaining stone steles, whose vanishing characters told the fading story of these Kaifeng Jews. Whether or not White was successful in bringing the remaining descendants of the Kaifeng Jews to Jesus Christ, I couldn't find, but he sure did try. Protestant missionaries purchased and later preserved any and all manuscripts they could get their hands on. And a lot of this stuff is held in the Clough Library at Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, as well as in other libraries, museums, and private collections around the world. A lot has been returned to Kaifeng authorities. There's a letter someone from Kaifeng wrote to someone or other in the West, and it said, quote, Morning and night... With tears in our eyes and with offerings of incense do we implore that our religion may again flourish. We sought elsewhere, but could find none who understood Hebrew, which causes us deep sorrow. In 1866, after 700 years of the whims of the Yellow River and Mother Nature, the Kaifeng Synagogue was destroyed for the last time, never to be rebuilt. And there was another attempt made to rescue and revive the Kaifeng Jewish community. This one may be 10 years earlier than the one of uh, William Charles White. This one in 1900. There was this sincere effort sponsored by the Sassoon family, the preeminent Jewish family in China. Their base was in Shanghai, and their business network stretched around the world. The Sassoons were Baghdadi Jews who escaped Iraq for, you know, the usual reasons. Jews tend to escape, like many of their faith in Iraq, Bombay, and Cairo, the Sassoons ultimately ended up in Shanghai. The patriarch of the family was David Sassoon. He was based in Bombay, or Mumbai as it's called today. He was the son of an illustrious family in Baghdad. His son was Elias Sassoon, who lived from 1820 to 1880. He was the first of the Sassoons to go to China and to establish their business empire there. I read at their, at their peak, Elias Sassoon owned something like 1,800 buildings in Shanghai. Elias Sassoon was one of the first to head to Shanghai after the ink was dry on the Treaty of Nanjing. When the Sassoon business empire was under his tutelage, the world was moving still at five miles per hour. After he passed, the uh, Sassoons ran this business empire from an office in the Cathay Hotel right at Nanjing Road in the Bund. That's the Peace Hotel now. It was completed in 1929. So anyway, 1900, the Shanghai Society for the Rescue of the Chinese Jews was set up. The Shanghai Jewish community, led by the Sassoon family, helped to fund the effort. Unfortunately, there was a lot of effort expended and very... Little to show for when all is said and done. In the end, they were only able to get eight Kaifeng Jews into Shanghai. While these visiting Jews did learn to read from the scriptures, the whole idea just never gathered sufficient momentum. There was something interesting, though, I read regarding the servants, you know, who worked at the house where these eight Kaifeng Jews were placed. They were so surprised that these Kaifeng Jews, and to a Shanghainese, these guys were hicks. You know, they were treated with the kind of civility reserved for Western guests. You know, up until World War II and the Nazi atrocities, the lion's share of the Jews in Shanghai were the Sephardic sort. It wasn't until European Jewry scattered in the run-up to World War II and just afterwards that European Ashkenazi Jews predominated in Shanghai society. Well, this whole... 
noble effort was well intended, you know, by the time the 1930s started to roll around, everyone, you know, including the Sassoons, had bigger fish to fry than rescuing the uh, Kaifeng Jews. Then 1937, the whole Japanese invasion begins, and that's it. It was every man for himself, including in Kaifeng. Today, especially after Gaika Kaifeng, opening up to the outside world, began in the 1980s, there have been efforts made to reach out to the hundreds of remaining descendants of these Kaifeng Jews. The synagogue is long gone and almost, you know, no one practices the religion anymore. But the legends and stories of these Jews who settled in Kaifeng and built this community live on. Something I read during my research, China never persecuted the Jews from ancient times all the way up until World War II when Harbin and Shanghai swung open their doors and gave refuge to Jews fleeing Russia and Europe. Chinese always had a good track record as far as, you know, getting along with the Jewish people and making room for them somewhere. There were Jewish communities all over China for a thousand years from the Tang Dynasty on, but it was only the community in Kaifeng that was so long-lasting and also well-documented Today, there are a few chosen ones in China who have been given official Jewish ethnicity on their identity papers, but there aren't many, and this is a sensitive subject for a number of reasons. The number of Jews is so small that they didn't make it to the list of 56 official ethnic minorities. I mean, if they gave the limited number of Jews or descendants of Jews this special recognition— then all these scattered minorities or groups that claim to be minorities might hop on the bandwagon and, you know, make similar demands. And there's also a large Hui or Muslim population, so, you know, got to consider what they might think, too. There have been several good documentaries and books written that gives more detail on this subject. The World Wide Web has a ton of newspaper articles and other material if you want to read more. There's a lot that, by sheer luck, did make it down to the present day for scholars to glean through and teach us. But for the most part, all the eggs of these Kaifeng Jews were in one basket as far as, you know, where the synagogue kept all the records and histories of this one-time ancient community. So much happened that we'll never know that was destroyed. Some Jewish communities around the world who are particularly passionate about this subject have reached out to these descendants of Kaifeng Jews, and some of these people in Kaifeng have reached out to some of these groups, too. So the spirit is rekindled, you know, if it ever left at all. The subject of Chinese Jews is one of those that is peculiar enough for us to do a double take. There's so much the two races share in common, you know, many Confucian ethics, diasporas from time to time, a worldwide community uh, persecuted from time to time as well, similar values on education, family, and other things. So I guess the story of the Kaifeng Jews isn't so far-fetched or hard to believe. In the overall context of Chinese history, the story of the Kaifeng Jews was but a small ripple in a vast ocean of all that has happened since the most ancient time of the Middle Kingdom. And here at the China History Podcast, we'll keep scratching the ground for any topics like this that our esteemed and select panel of China History Podcasters deems podcast worthy. This is Laszlo Montgomery, as usual, signing off from Claremont on another gorgeous and sunny SoCal day. It's March here, and we're still getting these nice two- and three-day hits of high 70s and low 80s. What did I do to deserve this? Take care, everybody, and I hope to see you next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.